We're going to get we're going to get quickly on because um, we don't have a huge amount of time with the shadow chancellor, and you can imagine, given the sort of target-rich environment um, that the last few days and even this morning has provided um, for a shadow chancellor, um, she uh, we we're going to have a rather one-sided conversation initially. Um, she's going to give some uh, remarks, five or ten minutes of remarks, um, and then we will have a conversation. And I will also, if I grab this iPad, I will also be trying to look at the questions as well. But Rachel Reeves, Shadow Chancellor, would you like to kick off? Thank you. So, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the work of the Economy 2030 Inquiry. Uh, today's report, I think, strikes at the truth that our economic problems are deep-rooted, but that they are far more than abstract questions of lines on a chart, that it is questions of growth, of productivity and inequality, which underlie the sense that Britain isn't working for far too many people today. Now, as many of you will know, I'm an economist by trade, spending the best part of a decade at the Bank of England, but I'm also a politician, so I want to spend the first few moments on the political situation that we find ourselves in. Because the tables have turned. On the day that the Prime Minister finally announced his intention to stand down last week, I was in Leeds meeting with business leaders. And what I heard from them was that, or the same as what I've heard repeatedly over recent weeks, that political instability at the top is a major drag now on market confidence. And the last week has shown us something else about this government. Because any lingering sense that the Conservatives are the party of economic responsibility has been shredded to pieces over the last few days. Instead of setting out serious plans to help people with the cost of living crisis, just as we hear terrifying estimates of what is going to happen to energy bills come October, we are presented with an extraordinary spectacle of a Tory tombola of tax cuts, with no explanation of what public services will be cut or how they would be paid for. Honesty and integrity really matters in politics, not just when it comes to parties and rule breaking, but also when it comes to economic policy making. The level of unfunded tax cuts being bandied around this week will blow a massive hole in the public finances. Every single Conservative leadership candidate supported the government's fiscal rules when they were passed into law only in January. But now they are prepared to take a flamethrower to them. Now, I've set out the fiscal rules that would bind the next Labour government, rules that I will stick to with ironclad discipline. Because responsible management of our public finances is the only route to providing the strong foundations that we need to reboot our economy, revitalise our public services and re-energise our communities. They will be paired with an absolute commitment to ending the shocking lace levels of waste and fraud that we've seen under this government, strengthened by the creation of a new office of value for money, to make sure that every pound of taxpayers' money is spent with the respect that it deserves. Now, back in September, I said that I was more than happy to take on the Tories when it came to economic competence, because I know that we can win. I didn't know at that point that they weren't even going to bother putting up a fight. Now, it is important that we put this moment into the wider context as well, because we face a succession of longer-term challenges, of low growth, of flatlining productivity, stagnant wages and now soaring inflation. Under the last Labour government, the UK economy grew by an average of 2.1% a year. It enabled us to deliver the biggest boost in investment in public services that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. But since then, growth has averaged just 1.5% a year. Now, we shouldn't kid ourselves that this is solely a product of long-term global trends. The UK had the second lowest productivity in the G7 in the 2010s. And as today's report shows, the UK's productivity gap with France and Germany has almost trebled since 2008, equivalent to an extra £3,700 in lost output per person. Stagnation isn't inevitable. 
our capacity for innovation, enterprise and old-fashioned hard work remains undiminished. Britain has huge opportunities if only we had a government that can bring the country together in a spirit of national purpose. But the only alternative to a high-tax, low-growth, high-inflation economy is a serious plan. Let me tell you what that involves. It means addressing our deep-rooted supply-side problems, which have contributed to low growth and stall in productivity, and are also a major factor in the spiraling levels of inflation that we're seeing now. In America, Treasury Secretary ja Janet Yellen has called this approach modern supply-side economics. It's based on the knowledge that government plays a crucial role in bringing about economic growth and tackling the structural challenges that have held us back. My vision for a modern supply-side economics in the UK involves three key things. First, we need to make sure that people can realise their potential and play an active role in a growing economy. For all ministers' talk of a jobs miracle, the reality is that we have a hidden worklessness crisis with employment lower than before the pandemic at a time of record vacancies and a million people missing from the workforce relative to pre-pandemic pandemic trends. That is why my colleague Jonathan Ashworth this week outlined plans from better links between employment and health services to flexible working and reforming how our job centres operate to help people return to work where they can. And fundamental to strengthening our supply of labour is supporting parents and especially mums to work. That means urgently addressing the cost and availability of high quality, affordable and flexible childcare. Second, we need to support British businesses to thrive. Working in partnership to get the economy growing again and provide the good jobs <coughs> that we need. That will rest on a modern industrial strategy. On our plan to use all tools of government at government's disposal to buy, make and sell more here in Britain. And on our climate investment pledge, which will help create new markets and leverage in private investment and drive carbon emissions down. Today's report argues forcefully and rightly that we must play to Britain's strengths. We are the second largest exporter of services in the world and pioneers in creative industries. We should be really proud of those strengths. That is why it was beyond belief that the Tories delivered a Brexit deal that hurts our creative and service industries. So we will address these flaws, building on a deal, ensuring at a minimum we agree the mutual recognition of professional qualifications and negotiate an EU-wide cultural touring arrangement for British creatives. And third, we need to support great British entrepreneurs, which is why last month I announced the launch of a new review for the Labour Party, led by a panel including Lord Jim O'Neill, to map out how we can build the institutional ecosystem that ensures that new and grown businesses have what they need to flourish here in the UK. This approach, a new modern supply-side economics, comprises an ambitious plan for growth. Grounded in the realities of the world in the 2020s, <coughs> not in Tory party fantasy, which would result in higher borrowing, increased mortgage rates, <coughs> and cuts to our schools, hospitals, and police. Labour's alternative is based on partnership, partnership between government and business, working for sustainable growth felt in every part of our country, with a serious plan and a determination to deliver it, built on the strong foundations provided by our fiscal rules, committed to honesty and integrity, because they are important virtues in public life and because they are essential to a confident growing economy with stronger public services and higher living standards for all. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much for that. And you talked about a lot of the long-term challenges, and that's been the focus of this conference. But obviously, in government, you have to balance what you're doing to tilt the economy in a better long-term direction with not to be making things worse in the short term. So 
Can I just start by asking you what seems to me quite a sort of basic question that any, certainly any centre-left party needs to answer in the environment that we find ourselves, which is, you know, what's the higher priority for you? Taming inflation, which hurts households, poorer households the worst, or restoring public services and giving teachers and doctors and others a decent pay rise? What do you think has to come first? Right now, we've obviously got to address the cost of living crisis, which is why since the start of the year, I've been arguing for a windfall tax to uh, put money in the pockets of, of people who are struggling with those higher bills. And, and that is the immediate uh, priority because people can't wait for that help with their energy bills, with the rising food prices, with the rising price of petrol to fill up their car. But then everything else, really, whether it is um, better wages for public sector workers, m more investment in our public services, or improving people's living standards, it all comes down to economic growth. And that's why I, I, I focused in, in the main bulk of my speech today on that plan, what I call modern supply-side economics, to get our economy growing again. Because the reason why the Tories have become a high-tax party uh, despite all of their promises uh, in the last few days. The reason they've become a high tax party is because they've become a party of low growth. And, and when you have low growth, it means you don't have the money to invest in public services. You always have to raise taxes any time you want to do anything because you're not getting those proceeds of, of, of growth. And so ultimately, everything you want to do, whether it is improving our public services, uh, improving living standards, or, or lifting all parts of the country to, uh, to, 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 to share in prosperity has got to come through a plan for growth. But, and growth is really important, but right now, what would be a reasonable pay rise for teachers and indeed ordinary workers across the country? What do you think would be a sensible, would be a responsible course for you as Chancellor to support? Well, the pay review bodies at the moment are in negotiations, and it wouldn't be right, whether you're in government or in opposition, to cut across that uh, process, and I, I don't um, uh, intend to do so. But the truth is, you're not going to be able to improve public services, including the wages being paid to public servants, who certainly deserve a, a, a pay rise. You're not going to be able to get any of those things on a sustainable basis unless you are growing the e economy. And, and that is the truth of it, which is why my focus is on how we can get growth and productivity off the floor so we can then bring in the tax revenues to invest in the public services that you speak about. And I'm just coming back to this because I do think, and you, as you said at the start, it reminded us that you're, you're, you're an economist, and it's quite important to sort of work out what we think about this inflation. I mean, that the higher cost of, of imported food and energy has made us poorer as a nation. It's a hit to all of our standard of living, a permanent hit. And all you can hope to do is at the margin affect the short-term distribution of that hit um, and certainly potentially affect the timing of that hit because you can, you can kick the can down the road, if you like, with, with matching wage increases, but at the cost, potentially, of setting off another round of inflation. So I'm just mm -hmm. I'm trying to get... Do you accept yeah. that there's been a permanent hit to our living standards? Whatever we manage to do about growth in the next five or six years with an amazing new plan, and what's the responsible way to respond to that? Well, I'd say two things uh, to that. First of all, you're absolutely right that this is a hit to our, our living standards, and you've got to decide as a government how to respond. I think that more should be done to help those at the lower end of the income distribution, which is why when I set out Labour's plans for a windfall tax, we used the vast bulk of that money to uh, put money into the uh, warm homes discount and expand the number of people getting the warm homes uh, uh, discount because that would ensure that people who most need the money are, are getting it. H who gets the most money under this government scheme? It's people who own two or three homes. You get £400 for a first home, two, 400 for a second, and, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, I think the Chancellor has got something like eight homes, so he's doing very well out of this deal. But if you are on a low income, then you don't get anything like that. So it is a badly targeted scheme. And so you're absolutely right that this has a, a hit and it's up to then governments how they respond and ensure, it, it, under my plans, that it would be the lower income people who are struggling most with the rising cost of living would get um, the, 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 the most help. So I think that's what you best can do uh, distribu distributionally. The, sorry, I mean, the Bank, so the Bank of England, I mean, I can oh, sorry, take all that point, but so the say, Bank of England yeah. would say that anything over sort of, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, governor of the Bank of England has specifically said he's, or he's certainly nervous mm. 
about wage growth that's going beyond 5% mm -hmm. across the economy because anything above, say, 3.5% would clearly be inflationary. Yeah. I just wonder, do you yeah. think he's right in making that assessment? Well, look, let's look at where the wage growth is happening. So wage growth in the top 1% is 20 times higher than wage growth for the bottom 10% and four or five times higher than for those in the middle. And wage growth in the private sector is running at something like four or five times higher than wage growth in the public sector. So um, I, 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 I don't think the Bank of England have suggested this, but I think the government would quite like to suggest this, that somehow um, ordinary working people, and particularly those in the public sector, are somehow responsible for this I inflation shock and, uh, and, 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 and as sustained levels of high inflation. It's just a fallacy. And the people who are getting the biggest pay rises are those at the top of the income distribution who are least affected by the rise in inflation. So if restraint is needed anywhere, it is restraint at the top. And you talked a little bit at the start about the, the sort of uh, bidding war on the tax cuts um, and this amazing opportunity to define Labour as the party of fiscal discipline and economic prudence. Um, if you do what you're talking about for giving more household support against the cost of living crisis, I'm just wondering, I mean, the tax cuts that the candidates for the Tory leadership are proposing, depending on who you talk to, would maybe add 20 to 40 billion a year to borrowing. Would you imagine, I imagine that's not going to be your highest priority income tax cuts, but would you be expecting to borrow that much more with you, as a result of your extra spending? How are you thinking about that trade-off? Well, I, I set up uh, a set of fiscal rules that I outlined at um, Labour Party conference last year. I think it's the earliest that any shadow chancellor has set out a set of fiscal rules, but I think it's really important to do that because you know, the truth is that the last uh, election, um, one of the big reasons for people abandoning Labour is they just didn't believe that our sums uh, added up. And, you know, frankly, in many cases, they didn't. And so I, I wanted to set out a set of, of fiscal rules. And those fiscal rules are, first of all, that all day-to-day -day spending would be financed by day-to-day -day tax receipts. That second, we would get our debt falling as a share of the national economy because debt is getting close to 100% of GDP. And then subject to that, we would invest in things to enhance our long-run uh, uh, productivity and growth potential. Uh, and that's why I set out also at party conference Labour's Climate Investment Pledge of £28 billion a year to invest in those industries and jobs of the future. But you can only do that if you get the day-to-day -day spending <laughs> under control. And the Climate Investment Pledge is really important to me because it is part of how we seize those opportunities as well as meeting our obligations, our moral obligations, to tackle climate change. Uh, but you'll only be able to do those if you control the day-to-day -day spending. And that is essential to me because that is about the, um, the, 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 the lifting growth which enables us to do all the other things that Labour governments uh, want to do as well. I just don't believe that these tax rises, are, 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 are tax, um, tax. Uh, cuts are, are justifiable or will have the impact that we need them to have, which is to, to, to boost growth. I don't think it is the right priority. And I think it is incumbent on the leadership candidates to say how they will be funded. Will they be funded uh, by cuts, as Nadim Zahawi has suggested, to uh, police and schools and hospitals? Or will they be funded by um, more government borrowing, which will push up um, uh, uh, debt interest payments and make it harder to invest in those things that will actually boost our growth and productivity? But in order to be the party of fiscal discipline, uh, you actually will have to be more disciplined than the Conservatives, which means if, when you spend more money on supporting households, you're going to have to, you are going to have to pay for it. Otherwise, you're just in the same boat as and them. That's so, how would you pay for that extra cost of living support? So, so for example, we set out the windfall tax at the beginning of the year and explained how we would use that to expand the warm homes discount, for example. I, and we, we put two amendments, I mean, this is quite techy, but we put two amendments to the windfall tax legislation on Monday. One was that there wouldn't be investment allowances to help North Sea oil and gas companies invest more in the extraction of fossil fuels, which means a third of the money that is coming in through the windfall tax goes straight back out to the same uh, companies, so one and a half or two billion pounds wasted in those investment allowances and we wouldn't be uh, giving money to people with second and third homes and that's another 200 million pounds of, of government money wasted so it's about priorities i support the windfall tax i was the first person to uh, propose a, a windfall tax 
but I would be using all the money from that windfall tax to actually help people with the cost of living crisis. It's also, Stephanie, why I said that we would um, um, charge VAT on private school fees. Uh, and we would use that money to help uh, catch up in our state schools. It's why we've said that bonuses paid to private equity bosses should be treated as income and not capital gains, and we would use those to improve mental health services. And it's why we have said that, uh, and this is a tax policy that no Tory has in endorsed yet, that we should get rid of the non-DOM tax status, uh, because it is not right that some of the wealthiest people who make their home here in Britain are not paying their fair share of tax. So it's about tax fairness. How can we ensure our tax system is fairer, and how can we also ensure that our tax system incentivises growth? And I do not believe that the Tory proposals are going to do either of those things. We had a lot today about the problem of UK relative productivity and indeed the, the sort of relative stagnation that we've had in terms of economic growth. And you talked a bit about it in your speech. There hasn't been a lot of support here for an emphasis on tax cuts and the tax as the, as the lesson, as, as the recipe for, for transforming British productivity. But philosophically, how is your diagnosis different from the Conservatives? How would we immediately notice in your long-term growth strategy, wow, this is a different kind of government? Well, I, I, I've tried to set out there three things that I think are essential for boosting the long-term productivity and growth through a focus on the supply side, modern supply side economics. So the, the first is around boosting labour supply. And that is a combination of, of helping people who have exited the labour market, and we've got something like a million more people on um, uh, sickness benefits than before the pandemic, so linking up employment and health support, but also improving access to, to childcare to sure, ensure that more parents, but particularly mothers, uh, can work, and not just in any job, but in jobs that are commensurate with their skills, not just ones that are commensurate with their caring responsibilities. So first on the, on the labour market side, a modern supply side approach. Uh, second, a modern supply side approach that works in partnership with business to ensure that we're seizing the opportunities out there, whether that is in, in, uh, in the data industries, whether it is in life sciences, or in some of those low carbon industries. How can government partner up with uh, business to ensure that we are making the most of our potential? And I, I see the tackling climate change as being important for three reasons. First of all, we do have that moral responsibility to our children and grandchildren. Uh, second, as the OBR's report just last week shows, the costs of inaction on climate change are much greater than the costs of action. So as a fiscally responsible chancellor, I would be taking those uh, uh, actions now. But also, because I see this as a, a massive opportunity to, uh, to, to ensure that there are good quality jobs paying decent wages in all parts of the country, whether that is uh, in, in, in producing uh, um, uh, new electric cars with the investment in gigafactories and supply chains, a hydrogen industry, uh, carbon capture and storage, tidal energy. Uh, you know, in all of these areas, we could be global leaders because of our industrial heritage, because of our uh, geography, because of our great universities and innovation. But other countries are now stealing a march on us, and the risk is that we'll end up importing all these things because we didn't take the opportunity now to grow those industries when we had a chance. Martin Wolf had an interesting comment. Uh, I don't know if he's still here, but he had an interesting comment in the earlier session that one of the things that our most successful sectors and services mm -hmm. um, have in common is they don't involve cross-class cooperation, and that Germany benefits from not having the same kind of class tension and class conflict. Do you agree with that? But I think, um, I mean, I wasn't here to hear what um, Martin said, but I thought, I don't I know if John... <laughs> well, OK, I don't know. It's, all right, it's but I wasn't here to hear the context of what he said. But I, I was reading something interesting that John Van Rienen was saying about the problems with inequality. I don't know if John has spoken today. But he says that inequality is one of the things that holds our country back. Uh, and I think it's a sort of similar point, but made in a different way. And it holds our country back because... We miss out on what he calls them the, the lost Einsteins and the lost Marie Curies uh, because uh, innovation rates amongst lower income people are, are lower because they don't have access to the same opportunities. So actually I think low, um, high levels of inequality, which is something that sadly scars I think our, our society as well as our economy, is holding back our, our economic potential. So we do need to find ways to ensure that everybody has access to those opportunities and I think also one of the reasons why, particularly during the austerity years, that growth has been um, poor is that money was taken out of the purses and wallets of people who actually spent their, uh, their income. And so I think there is a big, an important link, and a, I think under-understood, un, 
um, not well understood perhaps by policymakers, maybe they don't want to understand it, about the links between inequality and, and growth. I think both on the supply side in terms of the John Van Rienen point, but also on the demand side by sucking demand out of the economy when the economy was already weak are two of the reasons why our growth is lower than, for example, uh, the Germany's of, of the world. I'm going to take you back to just sort of the more immediate challenges. We're going to run out of time in a second. But you mentioned the sort of longer term or medium term plan for um, c combating climate change and getting to, to net zero. Obviously, the, the war in Ukraine, soaring gas prices have really messed with the short term bit of that strategy, of the net zero strategy for any country. Um, and markets are, uh, are starting to think now about the implications of a total cut-off by Russia of European gas uh, pipelines. And we'd be uniquely vulnerable to that because we, in the winter we import a lot of gas and we've got tiny amount of storage capacity as we're all learning about. So just, again, if you were in government the next few months, how would you respond to that differently uh, than the Tories? I mean, you have, you've already mentioned that you're not going to be giving extra incentives to the... Um, North Sea gas, but how would you respond to that problem, the, the fact that we could have another massive hit to gas prices? Well, f first of all, um, more extraction in the North Sea and uh, giving permission for Campbell or whatever is not going to make an impact anytime soon on, uh, on access to, um, to, to greater supplies of, of oil and gas. So I, I think that's a total um, misnomer. Um, one practical thing that we could be doing right now to reduce our need for imported uh, um, gas is to get on with insulating homes. And I set out last year how we could be insulating 2 million homes a year. And if all homes were brought up to EPC performance level C, it would reduce our imports of gas by 15%. That is something practical that government could do because these problems are going... in the next going, three months, though. Well, realistically, they could, they if this could, happens, it could happen in well, the, literally in the next few weeks. Well, I, I suggested yeah. this last year. They could have insulated two million homes before this winter if they had got on with this. But the problem is, is government keep delaying some of these really important things that are necessary to bring down our carbon emissions. And I think the big lesson of the oil and gas crisis and the spike in prices is that we have got to do more to invest in our own homegrown renewables uh, sector, including the storage of electricity, because without that, we are going to be and continue to be over-reliant on the import of oil and gas from countries that do not share our, our, our values, and we are beholden to them. So this is, should be a wake-up call, not for more oil and gas, because I don't think that uh, more extraction in the North Sea is the answer to the challenges we face, but instead a real focus in investment in homegrown renewables to reduce our carbon emissions, to reduce the price of electricity, and also, crucially, to boost our energy security. The public's been very supportive to date of... Uh, Ukraine and our very muscular support of Ukraine. If the polls started to suggest that with another round of massive energy price rises, that the public was actually starting to blame the war for these cost soaring prices and was actually starting to sort of wane in its support for Ukraine, would that affect in any way what you thought was the right thing to do for the British government? I think the, the biggest risk is if Vladimir Putin thinks that his behaviour and his aggression in Ukraine and elsewhere goes unchecked. That's what happened, unfortunately, after his invasion in Crimea. We can't let it happen again because he won't stop at Ukraine. We all know that. Uh, I don't think that the support of the British people will wane. I think the support given not just by uh, politicians, but even more so by the whole country for Ukraine has been uh, uh, an amazing outpouring. Um, but ultimately, when it comes to the sort of defence and security realities, uh, the most important thing is Vladimir Putin knows that he can't get away with this because that will put us in greater danger in the future. OK, so I apologise. We do seem to have ended up with Vladimir Putin instead of long-term growth. But anyway, <laughs> um, maybe that's the fact that we can at least continue in our strategy on Ukraine is a voice of optimism when so little else has been optimistic in this, in this uh, conference. But thank you very much, Rachel Reeves, and thanks, everyone. <laughs>